Welcome to another High Pressure Podcast. Today, we're really excited to have Rob D'Alessandro here from Meritus. Now, Meritus is a newer company. A lot of people are asking questions about it. We thought it'd be great to have on the podcast today to have a little deeper understanding about Meritus and also just in some general conversation about where the world's going and how we see the gas industry and some other maybe management tips and tricks that we can do. Okay, so today, Rob, welcome and thank you so much for making the time for us today. Oh, thanks for having me, George. You are considered a celebrity in our space, and I've always wanted to be on this podcast, so I, I'm looking forward to a great discussion with you today. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, and where are you located at? Where's your home for you? So I'm in New Jersey. Yeah, in New Jersey. Okay. So that's where our business was here. I'm glad you made some time for us today, so thanks so much. One of the things, I had a couple thoughts. When I hear the company name Meritus, I find myself wondering, what does Meritus mean and where does that come from, that concept of the name? I thought maybe you could touch on that a little bit. I didn't know there's a deeper meaning to the Meritus or it's just the name you guys decided. It's a unique name, so that's good. It stands out. Yeah, so it's interesting you should ask that because we sort of polled our at least founding companies, right? We had Gas Innovations and Atlas Welding were our, our two first partner companies, both of whom would love to have had the holding company named after them. Gas Innovations, a great name, Atlas Welding. Yep. But knowing that we were going to create this federation of, or this family of companies, we didn't want to, we didn't want to pick just one. So we wanted to have a name that could have a sort of universal appeal. And so like anybody else who's listening to your podcast, who is into branding, right? We hired a third party consultant, spent a whole lot of money. And Meritus was actually the one that we came up with ourselves. <laughs> but Meritus <laughs> signifies in many ways, we are trying to uh, assemble a group of the industry's finest, right? And the high performing businesses that are really top notch. So we think that uh, Meritus and the Federation exemplifies the quality of, the, of the, both the people yeah. and the businesses that we're assembling together. Yeah. And, and one of the things in the industry, we, we people have heard your name a little while back, it was like, who's Meritus? But I would like you to maybe, if you did like the 30 second thing, who is Meritus in what Meritus does. Yeah, sure, George. So we created, we founded Meritus in, in December of, of 20, right? At the end of the, the first year of the pandemic. The Meritus is a federation of high-performing businesses led by like-minded entrepreneurs and really good management teams. We run these companies as is independent distributors. So it's a loose, what we call federation or family of companies. Each of these companies keeps its own independent identity, maintains their existing culture and brand. And they're led by either the entrepreneurs that have founded those businesses or their key operators who have elected to stay and run them. So it's a collection yeah. or family of real high performing businesses with the aim of assembling a national independent distributor that could be competitive with the major manufacturers. Yeah. And at this size, roughly what size is your company at this point? So we're a little over 200 million today, and we should be by mid-year this year, we should eclipse 350 to 400 million this year. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So you got some good growth going on. Yeah. So yeah. originally our aspiration was to assemble a business about a $500 million business. But I think after two years of doing this, and given the excitement that we've garnered and the support we've gotten and the interest we've gotten from other targets, I think a billion dollar aspiration is a real possibility. And so we've reset our sights on that new goal. Yeah. So you think that's kind of like your five-year plan, be it a billion dollars? Yeah, I think probably a little longer than five years, George. It depends on what happens to the economy is in the next year or so. We're all sort of watching, right? It, it's it, If we have any economic headwinds, it could slow down that goal. But I think ultimately that's where we're aspiring to be, at least. Yeah, and you know, an interesting thing right now, growth is limited in some ways. As I, it sounds like you're looking at a lot of organic growth as well. When you have an acquisition, you're looking to do organic growth within that acquisition. And a lot of those things right now are, I was going to ask you some thoughts on this. How are you dealing with scenarios like when it's a year out plus to buy a, a tractor a trailer and things like this, which are obviously the infrastructure you need to grow and develop? How are you guys dealing with some of those challenges? So we're no different than any independent distributor in the country and the issues it faces in terms of supply chain issues and inflation the difficulty of recruiting people and retaining people in an escalating wage environment, right? We're all faced with the same constraints. 
our businesses, like I'm sure many businesses that you supply, we still had an extraordinary year last year in terms of organic growth, right? I, mean, I think our average of all of our partner companies was over 30% top line growth, which included both volume and price. So despite the supply chain challenges, the escalating prices of our suppliers, we were able to overcome that as I'm sure many of your listeners have. It really is a dichotomy, yeah. isn't it? We're supposed to be facing this recession yet even now through february we're well up over our plan which was not a modest plan for 2023 you know it, it's an interesting dichotomy right you see all those headline issues about what we're faced as an economy yet our underlying businesses yeah. continue to, put, to perform yeah for control over them be able to get supplies and control over like gases are you guys looking at possibly doing asus and having your own air separation plants and having your ability to feed yourselves? Is that something that you think is in your Yeah, I, th I think certainly as you get bigger, you have to be more self-sufficient. And I think the majors would attest to that. The majors are great partners for all of us. But ultimately, as you get larger, you have to start to vertically integrate and at least supply some products in certain geographies where the majors may not be primary. You have to. I think we all learned those lessons, those valuable lessons. But, yeah. but certainly I think that's in, that it, as we get bigger, that's certainly an aspiration is to start to vertically integrate, perhaps not in the atmospherics, George, but maybe in the, in the secondary products, whether it's helium or hydrogen or CO2 or those products. Yeah. Yeah. It has been a challenging time for everybody and almost on every front, but using the past, the industry would have a shortage, of maybe argon or a shortage of TIG wire or something else like that. But now, my gosh, we have a shortage of helium in many ways. We have a shortage of CO2. And maybe even more so with CO2, depending on what happens. When you look at something like CO2, how do you hedge that off? How are you looking at, we now talk about maybe having pipelines to sequester CO2. And I want to get your view on that, how you think yeah. that's going to impact the industry. No, I think you're right. And I think we're looking at Meredith, again, as fiduciaries of our partners, that we want to be try to be primary in CO2, right? Because many of the industries we service, many of our distributors, especially now that as we're getting more involved in the cannabis side, we're relying on CO2. But you have to be able to source those products. And obviously the challenges with ethanol source product, we've already We've seen the concerns or pitfalls associated with that. So I think all of us are looking at ways to become more primary in CO2. You know, it's not immediate either, George, but I think similarly with helium, I think what you're seeing is the distributors trying to go more direct to the wellhead. And as we've seen, some of independent distributors have been able to do that, is being able to contract directly with the wells as opposed to, as opposed to going through, through the majors. And I think that's a movement that you're seeing on the helium side as well. I'm wearing my green shirt. I'm a little bit in prep for St. Patrick's day here coming up, but as we're looking at what's happening with the banks and all this good stuff, is that something that has much of an effect on you as far as your organization? Cause you're an investment company. Does that have any direct effect or is that just what has obviously an effect on overall businesses potentially? I want to get your view on that perspective. Yeah, no, I, I, I think we're all watching. Right. Hopefully with the, with the Fed stepping in over the past weekend, they have curtailed, hopefully this becoming a situation that was uncontrollable. I think they're doing the best they can to control it, but hopefully what that means is that we'll see interest rates temper or decline. At least they will temper their increases, which, you know, which I think would help everybody in our particular model we are a leveraged business right that's our model is to acquire businesses with some sharing of equity and debt so we're a leveraged business right so when debt becomes more expensive it certainly impacts us unlike many distributors aren't leveraged or they are we're moderately leveraged we certainly for a pe sponsored business we're moderately leveraged right we're not we're not an AEA, our sponsor is not an aggressive borrower, but the cost of debt is, is significant, right? And many of us who use debt, we, you're becoming more judicious now in the way you spend money, the way you invest in your business. Yeah. And that's really where you're going to see ultimately the temper in the economy, right? The cost of debt will absolutely impact the cost of investment eventually it has to. Yeah. So I'm sure even in, in your business. Yeah. But hopefully that they've pushed it hard enough where two banks have failed. So now I think hopefully <laughs> that results in a, in a sort of re-examination of where they're going and it tempers any future increases yeah. we have. So when you're looking at the future, you talk about cannabis. Do you see that as a continuing large growth for you as a company? 
So remember that really one of our founding members is Gas Innovations located in Houston. And they are the country's essentially leading supplier of hydrocarbon gases. Hydrocarbon extraction is still the most popular means of, of extraction for cannabis. So we're really on the front end of cannabis growth because of our exposure through, through gas innovations. Now, certainly in some of the legacy markets, legacy meaning the early markets where cannabis was approved, those, those markets are still growing. It's just at a lower rate. But as, as more of these um, jurisdictions approve cannabis, you're going to see those are opportunities for growth in those new areas. And we are, we're partnering with companies because we supply them with hydrocarbons. And so we have, again, a front row seat as to how they're performing and how they're growing. And we're looking as well to continue to vertically integrate, to buy companies that are on the front side or close to these cannabis extractors. We bought two companies in, in California. One was a wholesale supplier of, of hydrocarbons. Another one was a niche cannabis hydrocarbon supplier that supplied essentially 100% of the business was supplying cannabis yeah. extractors. And I, th I think too, you had, you had, I actually got an education around cannabis extraction from the High Pressure Podcast because you had yeah. someone, I think it was right in the midst of COVID, right? In the early years, you had somebody dis yeah. describing the cannabis extraction process. So we, yeah, we think it's still a uh, growing business. It's moderated again in some of the legacy markets, but it's certainly growing. Yeah. It's a new for our industry, right? We're always looking for new applications for right. our industry. It's a new growth opportunity. Yeah. And I was going to ask you that, that exact question. When you look at the horizon, the next 24 months, you have certain areas that you're saying we're really going to be focused on that hyper focus because we think there's the next growth opportunity. At one point, lasers came out and all the cis gases and things like that. And then there's things like cryotherapy has come out. And do you see something that's the new thing on the horizon right now? Well, it's, I think cannabis, it's tough to call it the new thing, right? But be, because those cannabis is being approved in new jurisdictions, it's yeah. by definition, new growth. But we're really focused, again, we we've, we've bought businesses we're partnered with businesses in growing geographies, and we're really focused on helping them get the courage, the wherewithal to expand their offerings. Many of the businesses that we've partnered with are traditional industrial businesses. They don't have micro bulk today, right? Or they don't have, they're not core and spec gases. And so our focus is really trying to arm our partners with all the tools that a, you know, that a successful distributor should have at their disposal to grow because we're not tapping into certain of those markets in the areas where we operate because we don't have all the tools to do so. We have successful yeah. businesses, but they could be great businesses and really turbocharge their growth with the advent of new the technologies that we've seen been so successful in our space. Yeah. Rob, I really enjoy the conversations like this with folks like yourself because you've had a lot of experience, a lot of history, and I'd like to ask you a couple questions. One of which I'd like to ask you, they're more personal, if you don't mind. Of course. But one of which is like, from you as a manager and managing and working with people, is there somebody in your life that really inspired you or gave you a direction where you said, boy, they don't know how important those words they said to you or helped you in some mentoring way? Yeah, it's funny. You know, everybody points to their dad, I'm sure. It's very, it's cliche, yeah. right? But I don't know if you know my history, George, but you know, we had a 75-year independent distributorship in New Jersey. My grandfather founded it, then my father. And I was, I was the youngest of four. No one else showed an interest in the business. And my father said, look, you can come into the business, but you got to bring something to the table, right? And you can't come into the business and just expect people to respect you because you're my son. You got to bring something to the table. So he sent me to law school. And, um, and then I did my thing as being a lawyer. And then I said, dad, I'm ready to, I'm ready to come in. I came into the business. He said, okay, I'm ready. Cause I'm, he's 67 and he, it was time for him to retire or he wanted to step away. And George, I know you have daughters working with you. My father was a big personality. I was a pretty big person. I don't know if there was going to be room for two of us at our company, <laughs> but he wanted to go to Florida. And he said, look, it's time for you to come in. You did your thing in law. And no sooner than I came in, he started getting headaches within a few months. We were at an NWSA meeting in, uh, in Baltimore, I can remember it. And it turned out that he had lung cancer that had metastasized to his, uh, to his brain. And he died a couple months after. 
So I tell this story, Steve Byers, your associate knows it well, right? But I had to learn the business really fast from him, right? He infused in me, I'd be in the shower, showering, and, and he literally would come in and he'd sit on the, put the toilet seat down and start barking at me <laughs> because he said, look, I'm not going to be around. I'm dying. He said, so I want to infuse yeah. as much as I can into you. This is who you can trust. This is who you can't trust. And the one thing he said to me is, if you ever have to bring on a partner, he said, sell the business. That was his view, which is funny because I've had a ton of partners over the years. It's the one piece of advice I didn't, I didn't follow with him, but he was my mentor. He introduced me to the gas industry. That was in 1996. Okay. And uh, I didn't realize that it would be my career, my, my career. And so I have been, I say to folks that I'm, I'm seeking a partner with, I've been a distributor owner. We were a joint venture of Praxair's for a number of years. And then ultimately I worked for Praxair like you did before I ultimately went out now back on my own again to do Meredith. So, um, you know, you asked me, I'm sorry for the long winded response, but there's no, that's a great, a great answer. But your dad is a very influential person in your life, especially in our industry and our businesses, our parents, not just our dads, a lot of moms are involved in these companies too, yeah. but he was the one who pushed me, brought me in. And ultimately, uh, arm me with the uh, ammunition yeah. to be successful. So, yeah. Hey, you know, it's interesting too when you hear those words in the back of your head, right? When you hear your father, whoever it is, your mother talking to you. And at the time, depending on where you're at in your career and your experiences, all of a sudden those same comments can mean something very different as you go through your career and exposure to new things. I find a similar thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Something I thought, I, I didn't think it had that much meaning maybe when I was 22 hearing it. And all of a sudden at 42, you're like, oh, that's what that means. Exactly right. But they resonate. And so you hope to pass it on as you will to your children uh, as you get older. But yeah, that was my introduction yeah. to the gas business. So I'd like to ask you, when you get up in the morning, what's the thing that really jazzes you? Like you're going to come to work and you're going to like, this is what I'm, this is what I'm here for. This is what excites me and gets Rob going for the day. Yeah, it's funny. You should ask. Honestly, George, working for myself now and for my partners is what gets me, gets me motivated. So I had done basically 15 years with Praxair, right? So I had my original business. I had ultimately joint ventured with Praxair with my business and then sold the business to Praxair. And I became the, the lead m and person for PDI, a business you work for, right? You know, and I ran PDI's uh, m and for a, a lot of years, for essentially 15 years. But I was working for a big company. And while it's an extraordinary company with extraordinary people, when I would sell somebody on the opportunity to sell their business to PDI, I, in the back of my head, I knew what was going to happen, right? We'd buy a company and ultimately that, that seller would often leave, right? Or their people would often leave because Praxair, like Airgas, these strategics, they, they integrate the businesses into their brand, into their identity, right? So under this model today, these are my partners. I'm working every day for my family and my partners. It's a way different, it's a way different motivation. And so we convinced a lot of these sellers to many of them are now are sons and daughters of the, of the founders, right? We've said to them, you're trading your parents for us, right? I'm now your partner and you don't have mom and dad there. You have me, right? And Scott, my partner and our other folks at Meredith and the, the other Meritus operating companies. So you ask me what motivates me every day. It's to take care of and do what I do well for the benefit of my family and these, and the partners. Now we say to these folks in Meritus, you don't work for me. I don't work for you. We work for each other. If Steve Stobaugh, the president of Tulsa gas and gear, who runs Tulsa gas and gear, I want him to kick but every day, that's his job. You go run Tulsa, you kick ass in Tulsa every day. And you rely on me to go out and, and bring in new members of Meredith, to go out and sell Meredith and grow Meredith. And ultimately we rely on each other as partners. You traded your dad, Steve, for me, right? And I'm now your, your partner, your family. And so honestly, Every day, you know, we're working a lot. <laughs> well, you know, starting a business, it's hard, right? And we're grinding all the time, but the motivation to do that is, is to carry out the obligation that I have to do well for all these folks that are relying on me. Yeah. 
a lot of conversations are out there today about culture and another conversation, big point is about engagement. And they're showing that people are really engaged. They can have a 40% more productivity. There's a lot more enjoyment in their life. They're really excited about it. And you think about engagement, I want to get your view or your thoughts on how you go about, I don't mean just to study Meredith, but just in general, how you go about engaging people where they're really, they're in it. They're part of it and they're in the moment, living the moment and really engaged. Do you have some advice or some thoughts that you do that makes folks really engaged? That's the key, right? And if you can get an engaged workforce, people that act like owners, right? We used to say that at PDI, right? If you can capture the hearts and minds of the people and get them to act like they own the business, you can drive any project, you can create, close on any sales lead, you can fulfill any request if everybody's pulling in the same direction and care and engaged. And obviously management techniques are, are a way to do that in terms of pushing decision-making right down to the lowest level of people closest to the work, make decisions. You engage them in the decision-making process. You let them in to the performance of the business, right? You publish your results, you publish key performing, the key performance indicators so that everybody understands the levers that I pull, how ultimately that translates to success in business. But I think the number one thing, just to relate it back to Meredith, because again, we're creating Meredith as a model of what we believe in. And we are offering equity to all of our employees, essentially. The employees of the operating company had the opportunity to invest in Meredith. And right now, I think we are upwards to 30% of Meredith level employees. These are drivers, customer service representatives, store people, salespeople who have said, look, we believe in the aspiration of Meredith and we want to be a part of that, right? So we brought the threshold down to 10,000, make it affordable. And we raised something like, George, two and a half million dollars, I think, in $10,000 checks, $100,000 checks from people who believe and wanted to be an owner of an industrial gas business, right? And because that's not typical. So to drive engagement, obviously it's through management practices and engaging people close to the work showing and informing and keeping them inf informed on the direction of the business. But I think the real way to do it too is to offer equity to your employees and get them engaged and involved into the cap structure of your company. And I think that's what we're doing. It, it makes it concrete. It certainly makes it concrete. They, people aren't acting like owners. They are owners. <laughs> and I'm asking these questions because I think regardless of what business you're in, there's certain key things that people can do that can really drive their business. And then I think that's interesting to the listeners and all. I had this one for you. What is the hardest thing in a day? What is your hardest thing for you in a day? I guess we could almost say most unenjoyable as well, but I'll just ask you, what's the, what do you find is the hardest thing as the manager? Yeah, it's good. A manager of people, too, that's a really difficult question. But I think that the, the hardest interactions I have in the day is is ultimately giving somebody, I think, criticism or you've said differently, con constructive feedback. I have learned my signature as a manager is to be fair, right? And so to make sure that I am as equally applauding and giving positive feedback as I am criticizing. I believe I, you can criticize as long as you are also equally giving praise. And um, and I have a real time, look, it's not an easy, it's not an easy thing. I have, when I look at myself, introspectively, I like to be liked, right? And many of us do. And so right. when you have to deliver bad news to somebody or criticize somebody and or reprimand somebody, it's, that's tough. And I dread those conversations, no matter, my whole life I have, right? And so I think it's a personality issue that you like to, you know, again, like to be liked, right? Is That's hard. Right. But I think too, I think just managing everything in this work from home environment, George, it's hard. I'm sure a lot of your a lot of your listeners are struggling. A lot of the business owners are back in work, but us in the virtual world, it's really hard building camaraderie and a team when you're not in an office anymore. And I know at Raderman you are, and I know in my history at Praxair, my own distributorship, I was. You'd walk the halls, you'd communicate with people. But yeah, the toughest thing I have in a day is that I can't put my arm around people I work with and or throw something up on a board, walk into their office and say, hey, let's chew on this. Let's... Uh, Let's try to get, let's come up with a good idea through, through just conversation. It's hard to do that. Right. It is. And that's an interesting thing as we look at the hybrid, how do you see the hybrid work force in the future for you? Do you see this as a continuation where people work remotely and maybe we have more things, next advancements to Zooms that make it more, because I, I agree with you, it's very hard. 
because it almost becomes much more purposeful. You have to really plan and how to get folks together and whether it be by having a meeting where people do come together or by Zoom uh, or Teams. So how do you see that in the future for you? Do you see, do you think that people are going to be coming back and find the virtues of all being back in the office or do you think it's going to stay hybrid moving forever? Look, I, I think it's going to be a hybrid. I don't know if you agree, but I believe that there's a lot of benefits in being able to work from home. And it's also, yeah. there's a lot of benefits to recruiting, right? I, we're recruiting new people for Meredith. And because we're virtual, right, I'm not limited to a certain, to a certain population of people or a certain geography, right? We're going to take the best candidates, whether they come from California or Maine, right? For, again, yeah. for, for positions that merit us, it's a little different when you have a local business and you're trying to recruit. But what I'm finding, yeah. the, the two difficulties I'm finding is um, with the younger people recruiting them, you and I have done our thing. I've been in the office. I've been there, done that. I, <laughs> we went out to, for drinks at the end of the day, and that was, or I had nice lunches with my coworkers. So I don't need to be in the office five days a week anymore at my age or at your age. But the younger generation is missing that. And so that's hard. And we have certain folks that you know, I really f I feel for that they're not having that, that engagement at the office because they are, they're largely remote. But I also think it's hard yeah. to turn off too, George. It's, you are, it's not now, you know, when in our father's generation, they came home from work at the end of the day or our mother's father's generation, they come home from work and the phone, there was no yeah. shelf. They were done. They were having dinner. Or you were watching whatever with them at night, right? They weren't engaged with their business. We are not, we are, we're constantly engaged, aren't we? So you're never really off. So to answer your question, I think the hybrid model's here to stay. There's a lot of benefits, but I think people have to be conscious of making sure they're maintaining their work-life balances. And especially for our younger generation, we've got to get them, find ways to get them more and more engaged in an office setting, I think. Yeah. A lot of things happen inadvertently. You don't really know it. Your ears pick up on things. So when you're in one office, you might know what's going on just because you've already heard a couple of conversations that you weren't really involved in, but you heard them. And I think in a training perspective, it is challenging because a lot of times in training, people would be able to hear a phone conversation, say, hey, next time this might be helpful to you. Although very purposely, you can also have things where you have a mentoring scenario where you're both on the line, even if you're not in the same facility. So it's just doing things and sometimes Different. differently, but you have to formalize it. And I think that's the big eye opening I've had is that, that we did things a certain way before because it worked that way. But if you look at even how that worked, we purposely had made those processes in place. It's just developing those new processes and putting them in place. Yeah. They're different, they're uncomfortable, and there's a lot of learning curve to it for sure. The remote situation, when you have people for training, all that, do you find yourselves bringing people in for meetings then and having a once a quarter or once a month type thing where you've hired some new people in different geographies. How do you manage that? Do you just do it all remote or do you bring people in to, to do some of part of your training? Yeah, no, it's, I think you have to make efforts, right? So at Meredith, so remember Meredith is a holding company and then we have these different operating companies, but Meredith, the, our staff is growing and our staff is growing because these different operating companies need resources. So for instance, a, an operating company may not be able to afford a dedicated HR director. So we've now hired an HR director at the Meredith level, which is a resource for all the different businesses. And similarly, we're for marketing or product management, right? Or safety and environmental, right? So a safety resource, an operations resource that can be used by all these different businesses. So now Meredith is growing and we're we're, we are operating all over the country, right? My partner, Scott's in South Carolina. My my partner, Mike, and Mike Ma, our CFO's in Philly. I'm in New Jersey. Our product management guy's in Maine or Massachusetts. I mean, we're all over the place. So we have to, to your point, we have to make an effort to get together. And so yeah. next week, for instance, we're bringing all of our partners together at, at Meredith. So two or three representatives per business, all of whom are again, owners of our business, but they're all coming in for a retreat. We do it twice a year and we're going to celebrate our successes. We're going to talk about sort of the themes for next year. They're going to do a lot of best practice sharing. There's a whole half a day where they're going to each company president or representative is going to talk about what they did well. But it's, again, it's yeah. forcing people together to have that discourse. And at the Meredith level, we're trying to, to make sure that once a quarter, we're at least 
together, face to face, having dinner together, yep. having lunch together, so that we can interact more regularly than doing it on Zoom. Zoom's hard. It's a hard, hard to stay focused for a lot, long period of time without checking your phone or looking at your other screen or doing whatever, or my dog chewing my shoe or whatever it is. But, yeah. but yeah, so we're making a we're making an effort to have in person training, as well as couple it with some virtual trainings. Yep. What, again. What, for instance, none of our companies had, many of them didn't have employee handbooks or had been trained on employee practices and procedures, right. whether it's anti-harassment, anti-discrimination, those kinds of things. We found some gaps in our companies. So that we can do on a virtual basis, right? Here's the, here's the module, sign up for it. We can train you virtually with a, with a module online, right? But there's certain yeah. things that, you know, that you have to be in person for, and we try to, yeah do that yeah, we, sales training too. We, we, yeah, we have a similar thing. We do a lot of training on a lot of different products, <clears throat> whether it be hoses or cryogenic valving in all different areas. But like we do the top end doer repair parts and that's where we go out and actually fix the tanks with customers and teach them how to fix tanks in their shop. Yeah. That's an on-site on location. Site. Can we do some supports after that by Zoom and things for sure we can. And I also was thinking about resources. I was really thinking about, you talk about NWSA, which is now GATA. And I was thinking about NWSA, it was interesting. I think it was about 28 years ago, they had a speaker and he's a futurist. He was a business futurist, what he thought the future would be for businesses. And I remember he said, it's just gonna all meld together. There won't be private and business time. It'll just be one time. I thought that sounds a little bit extreme, right? <laughs> Gosh, that's it. But I, and you're like, how are we gonna get there? We didn't know about the iPhone and other things like this. And all of a sudden everything's right there all the time with us. We wake up to it, we go to bed to it. You see everybody on it when the plane lands, as soon as the plane lands, everybody's on it. So it really has melted. And I think your comment about that balance in life, because it brings some positive things too. It allows more flexibility to take care of and do other things. Maybe with your children at school, you can pop in there. At the same time, you could be doing other work in between. So it is interesting how it has melded together. It's become a new challenge for all of us. Uh, I think I found myself last night working with some people at two in the morning in some other countries. And this morning I was up at seven in the morning doing other things, right? So it's, right. <laughs> it's in another part of the world. So it can, you can never get it all done. And it's almost that rule that you're not gonna get it all done. So how do you weigh decisions, what you're gonna work on? Yeah, yeah, yeah it's yeah. true, right? It does, but I think your earlier comment that it does for younger parents that are balancing children and children activities and having mom and dad home and rather than, mom and dad in office, have mom and dad at home to participate, whether it's just even to have lunch, right? You get off your Zoom yeah. and you go in and now you're having lunch with everybody and then you go back to work, right? You would never do that. But it, it does <laughs> offer some challenges, all right? Because you have a driver that doesn't have that luxury of that. You have right. a driver, you have some other jobs, that, a pumper, it, they require to be there. Right. Do you find any, have you found any kind of difficulties with that, with people's view of that in your organization? No, I think, look, I think everybody just understands it's the evolution of the business, business and work, yeah. right? And unfortunately, right, where many of us were home during the pandemic, who could be home, those drivers and plant workers were getting product out the door. And so even then, yeah. right? Yeah. So it's not just in the dichotomy of today, but it was really highlighted during, during COVID. Yeah. The really segregation of the responsibilities in our industry, right? And those folks right. don't get a lot, don't get enough credit, yeah. right? Yeah. I really do appreciate the take the time today and answer all the questions. I think that for me, it was really fascinating to hear your view on how you look at things and how you're doing things. I don't know if you have any kind of key. I, if there's something I didn't ask you, you wished I'd asked you. Is there anything I, you wished I'd asked you I didn't ask? No, no, I appreciate it. We're, we, I really appreciate you inviting me. As I said in, in my comments to you, George, you're so well thought of. Your family is. The business is a terrific supplier in our industry. And I appreciate you putting the spotlight on, on Meredith. Not necessarily on Rob, but on Meredith. We're really proud of what we're putting together. I think it's really unique in our industry. And I appreciate you giving me the opportunity, the platform to talk about it. So thanks for having me today. Right. Okay. Thanks. It was great having you. I'm sure everybody's going to really enjoy understanding Emeritus a little bit more than they did before. So thank you for your time. You got it, George. I'll see you soon.